Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, <clears throat> we're there in First Timothy chapter 3. And uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for coming. And uh, my wife and I and our family, were excited to be here. And uh, that's an interesting story uh, Brother Jared told about the salvations being like a haircut. And I don't <clears throat> never heard that, uh, that one before, but something I had heard, it, it, it made me think about one time I was out soul winning, and this guy told me that salvation is like taking a, a college course. And he said, you know, you can enroll in the class, but that doesn't mean you're going to pass the test. And I'm not really sure what that means, but I'm pretty sure it's heresy. Uh, so uh, anyway, people got, they have all sorts of weird thoughts about, uh, you know, what salvation is. And so it's our job to try to teach them what the Bible teaches, the simplicity of the gospel. And uh, so, so praise the Lord for that. And uh, so we're, we're excited to be here. And we're there in First Timothy chapter 3. I'm not continuing tonight. Uh, I thought about doing the habit series, just jumping into Brother Jared's habit series, just because I've always wanted to eat McDonald's while I'm preaching. But, you know, I figure, I figure it's been done. So, you know, it wasn't something that I needed, wanted to do. But tonight, um, I, I want to preach a very specific sermon. And... Um, really to the church family, and you probably hear me say this a lot, um, Lord willing, this year, uh, later on this year, uh, I will be ordaining uh, Brother Jared as the pastor of this church. And um, at that point, this church will be an independent Baptist church. You'll have a pastor and a pastor's wife and a pastor's family and pastor's kids and all of that. And I uh, see it as my job when I'm here, and I'm not here very much, but when I am here, to try to help prepare you for that transition. For that reason, if you've noticed, when I came here, I'll preach sermons like how to be a great church member, or uh, the working church, and how to be a church that works uh, in the ministry and works together. And uh, I'll continue to preach sermons like that because I, I want you to be ready uh, for the day that you are independent, that you are uh, not a satellite uh, of our ministry in Sacramento, but your own uh, church here. And what I'd like to do is preach a couple of sermons as I prepare you for soon having a pastor. I'd like to preach a couple of sermons on the subject of how to treat your pastor and how to treat your pastor's wife and how to treat your uh, pastor's family. And uh, so that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight. Specifically tonight, I'm going to preach to you uh, on the subject of how to treat your pastor's wife and family. And uh, you're, we're there in First Timothy chapter 3. Please keep your place there because we're going to come back to that. Uh, but go with me, if you would, to First Peter chapter 3. And if you're there in First Timothy, you're just going to go past Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, into the book of First Peter. Keep your place in First Timothy. We're going to come back to it. Go to First Peter chapter 3. Let me go ahead and say this. Um, the reason for the sermon is to prepare you. Um, as a young church, as a newer church, getting ready to transition into an independent church, we want you to be ready to know how uh, you should be, how you should act. Um, I'm not preaching this sermon because there's any problems or anything like that. Um, but what we have learned uh, in ministry is that preventative preaching is always better than corrective preaching. If you can teach people ahead of time, uh, you know, and prevent problems than to try to correct problems after the fact. And, you know, you might be here tonight or maybe even listening online and thinking, you know, a sermon on how to treat your pastor's wife, you know, who, what is this sermon for and who is this sermon for? And let me just go ahead and kind of just by way of introduction explain that. Number one, it's for the church people. It's for a church family to know how to treat their pastor's wife. And uh, it's not just the pastor's wife, you know, it's any uh, wife in ministry. It could be a deacon's wife, it could be a staff wife. You know, at Verity Baptist Church, we have a, a deacon and a deacon's wife. We have staff that is on, on our staff, and we have staff wives. And uh, really, it's for the church family, this church family here in Fresno, but any church family to know how they should deal with how they should treat uh, their pastor's wife and other uh, uh, wives in ministry. But the sermon is also for current pastor's wives. 
and deacons' wives, and staff wives. And, and again, not just here in this room, but uh, the Lord has allowed our church to have a ministry that allows uh, that w uh, people listen to the preaching online. And I'm sure there'll be some pastor's wives and deacon's wives and evangelist wives that might listen to this sermon. And I want them to know that this sermon's for them too, to help them, uh, you know, to really understand their role in uh, the ministry. And, and, and by the way, let me just say this. Um, as far as, you know, pastors, deacons, staff wives uh, that we have in Verity Baptist Church or that came out of Verity Baptist Church, I will tell you, we've, we've got awesome ladies. And I've got nothing but good things to say uh, about our pastor's wife, my wife, and, and um, any other leader, uh, leadership wives that we have in ministry. But I will say this, unfortunately, that's not the case in all churches. And not all churches have, you know, just uh, great pastor's wives. And if there are some listening, you know, this is a sermon for them. But also, let me say this, this is a sermon for future pastor's wives. Because hopefully, sitting even in this room, there are some young men and some young ladies that may go into ministry someday. And um, they're going to have a pastor's wife. They're going to be a deacon's wife. They're going to be a staff wife. And this is a sermon for them as well. And this is a sermon that needs to be preached because in ministry, the devil puts a big target on the pastor and his family. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, if you're there, the Bible says this, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. Now, I want you to notice these words, as unto the weaker vessel. Now, usually when uh, pastors or when guys get up and preach this uh, verse, you know, they talk about the weaker vessel. They say the wife is the weaker vessel and, uh, you know, we have to uh, uh, help them and protect them because they are weaker. And to an extent that is true. But I always like to point out the fact that I want you to notice it doesn't say as unto the weak vessel, right? Because if it said the weak vessel, then that would be in comparison to, uh, you know, the man who's a strong vessel. But that's not what it says. It says, as unto the weaker vessel, that is in comparison to the man who is weak as well. Because we are, the only one that's strong is the Lord. <laughs> the only, we're only strong in the Lord. Men are weak. Women are the weaker vessel. We all need to rely on the Lord. But the point is this, that in ministry, there is going to be a target on the pastor's back. There's going to be a target on the pastor's wife's uh, back and on the family. Because obviously, if you can attack the pastor's family, you can attack the ministry. So this is why a sermon like this is important, because we want to teach the church family how to treat their pastor's family, and specifically tonight we're talking about the pastor's wife, and, um, and how to protect uh, her in that role as well. And I think next time I come, I might preach a sermon on how to treat your pastor. But tonight, I, wanna, uh, I want to specifically deal with how to treat your pastor's wife. And there's a lot of things that people believe about this and things that maybe, maybe thoughts you've had that may be inaccurate. I'd like to help teach you what the Bible teaches about that. Go back to First Timothy chapter 3, if you would, and look down at verse number 11. And let me just begin, uh, and, and I'll, I'm going to give you four points uh, tonight. If you can write these down, I, uh, I think it would help you. And on the back of your bulletin, of course, there's a place for you to write some of these things down. And I'd like you to, first of all, recognize the pastor's wife's place. The first thing that we should do when we talk about the pastor's wife and the pastor's family is that you should recognize the pastor's wife's place. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, which is the chapter we read at the beginning of the ser uh, sermon, we find the ordination qualifications for both the pastor and the deacon. And in those ordinations, we notice that the families are mentioned. Uh, the Bible talks about the pastor being the husband of one wife, uh, that he needs to be able to rule his own house well. Here in verse 11, it's specifically about the deacon, but the qualifications are pretty much the same for the pastor as well. And here the wife is being mentioned. Verse 11 says this, Even so must their wives be grave. And the word grave means serious. And that doesn't mean that they can't smile or joke around a little bit, but it means that they should take life seriously, that they should be grave in their purpose, realizing that uh, we, we are uh, uh, living, in, what we're doing is serious business. Then it says not slanderers. That means a slanderer is someone who attacks the reputation of another by falsely damaging their reputation. And uh, deacon's wife, a pastor's wife, 
cannot be someone who is a slanderer. It says sober. Again, the idea is to be serious, not under the influence of drugs or alcohol, of course, as well. Faithful, that means to be consistent, loyal, or dependable. It says in all things, notice verse 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. And again, not divorce, ruling their children and their own houses well. So we see that God here mentions the wives in the qualifications for ordination. Now there's a couple of things I want you to uh, notice in regards to the wife or just kind of takeaways in regards to the wife and the ordination qualifications. The ordination qualification shows us that the pastor's wife does not hold an office in the church. And we want to be clear about that. You know, when you talk about the pastor's wife or the deacon's wife or the staff wives, there are generally two extremes that people like to go. One extreme is to look at the pastor's wife as like a position in the church, that the pastor's wife holds an office in the church. And this, is, this is why you see, you know, Joel and Victoria Osteen, right? They're like co-pastoring, co-partnering, you know, she gets up there and preaches better than he does and, you know, all that stuff. You, you know, and, and that's where you kind of get that idea. Sometimes, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this, um, but, you know, it's not something we do. It's not our culture. But sometimes in these types of churches, they'll call the pastor's wife the first lady, right? And we've had that, you know, where sometimes people come to our church and they call uh, my wife the first lady. And, you know, we always kind of chuckle. And, and, and there's, there's, that's not sinful, you know. I just, I just, they're going to call her the first lady. I want them to call me the president is what I think. But, you know, um, you know but, but sometimes people, they, they have this idea that, like, the pastor's wife, is like the female pastor or the co-pastor or the lady pastor and that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible, if you notice, if we look here in 1 Timothy 3, the qualifications when the wife is mentioned, it is all a reflection on the husband. You know, she needs to be uh, faithful and not a slanderer and sober and grave and all, and, and, and all these things because the Bible says the husband is the, uh, uh, the husbands of one wife ruling their children and their own house as well. It has to do with how the husband rules a house. It is a reflection upon the husband. So one extreme is to say, oh, the pastor's wife is like the co-pastor, and that is an unbiblical extreme. And the ordination qualifications show us that the pastor's wife does not hold an office uh, in the church. There's only uh, a, a few offices in the local New Testament church that is of the pastor, of the deacon, and of the evangelist. And the pastor's wife is the wife of the pastor and the deacon's wife is the wife of the deacon and the evangelist's wife is the wife of the evangelist but they do not hold an office in the church with that said let me say this the other extreme because one extreme is the pastor's wife holds a position holds an office in the church that's an unbiblical extreme but then there's another extreme that i believe is just as dangerous and it is uh you know, this extreme that says, well, the pastor's wife is just like any regular church member. Just there's nothing special about the pastor's wife. There's nothing special about the deacon's wife. There's nothing special about uh, any of these ladies. You know, they're just, they're, they're, they're just like a regular member. But if you notice, the ordination qualifications show us that the pastor's wife, not only does she not hold an office, but it also shows us that she's not a regular member. You say, well, what do you mean she's not a regular member? Well, you know, just think about it. If I'm talking to a man who's married who's a regular member, just a regular member here at Verity Baptist Church in Fresno, or a regular member at Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, let's say I'm talking to a man that's married, and let's say that his wife gets backslid in and quits the church, then what do we do? I mean, that's happened from time to time. Where a wife gets backslid in, she quits coming to church, she, 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 go, she just stops walking with the Lord. You know, in, in a situation where it's just a regular man in the church and his wife gets backslid in and quits the church, what do we do? We pray for her, we reach out to her, we try to encourage her to, get, to come back to the Lord and do things like that. Okay, what if the pastor's wife gets backslidden and quits the church? You know what happens? The pastor has to step down. In many cases, the church is closed down. So, you know, this idea that says, oh, the pastor's wife is just like any other regular church member. Well, here's the problem with that. If the pastor's wife quits the church, the pastor has to quit the ministry. 
So, you, you know, this extreme that says, well, the pastor's wife's just, just like any other member. There's nothing special about her. That's not necessarily the case either. The ordination qualifications, the fact that they mention the wife of the pastor and of the deacon and of people that need to be ordained, those ordinations and the fact that they're mentioned there, it shows us that, yes, the pastor's wife does not hold an office in the church. That's one extreme, but it also shows us that the pastor's wife's not just a regular member like anybody else. Because here's the thing, when ladies quit the church and leave the church, our hearts break and we, we break for them, but, you know, the pastor doesn't have to step down. The deacon doesn't have to quit his job. That nobody has to leave the ministry as a result. So the first thing I want you to understand when it comes to how to treat your pastor's wife is recognize the pastor's wife's place. She does not hold a position or an office, but she's not just a regular church member just like everyone else because lots of people can quit and the pastor continues on in ministry. But if his kids quit, if his wife quits, that affects his qualifications. So recognize the pastor's wife's place. Secondly, go to Genesis if you would. Genesis chapter 2. It's the first book in the uh, Bible. should be fairly easy to find. Genesis chapter 2. And look at verse 18. Not only would I like you to recognize the pastor's wife's place, but secondly, tonight, I'd like you to realize the pastor's wife's purpose. What is the purpose of the pastor's wife? Well, like any wife, the pastor's wife is to be a helpmeet to her husband. Are you there in Genesis chapter 2? Look at verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, the Bible says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him, and notice these words, help meet for him. And help meet. Now what does that mean, and help meet? The word meet means suitable. It means someone that is there, uh, that is fitted correctly, to help. A help meet is a help suitable for who? For him. Amen. For the man. The Bible teaches that the wife is to be the help meet for her husband. I realize today this is not preaching that's, 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 uh, that, that's really uh, uh, said a lot. Obviously, I know here, and I know, uh, you, you know, Brother Jared preaches these things, but in our culture today, this is not something that's emphasized a lot, but the Bible says that the woman was created for the man. Amen. The Bible says that she was created to be his helpmeet, and here's the truth. The truth is this, wife, that it is your job in, in this relationship, it's your job to be the helpmeet for your husband, and you will find your purpose in life, and you will find joy and contentment in life when you embrace that role. You know, what the devil tries to get the, 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 the ladies to do today is to say, no, you, you got to let him be your help me. You go be the president of the United States. You go be the CEO of some company. You go be the governor and have him stay home. That is not the roles that God, and I'm not preaching on that tonight, but the point is this. God created a wife to be a help meet. To be a help suitable. You say, well, how does that apply to the pastor's wife? Well, because the pastor's wife is the pastor's help meet, she obviously is going to be heavily involved in the ministry of her husband. I mean, it, it, it would make sense, it would make sense that any wife be interested and involved to whatever uh, uh, ability and whatever her husband is doing and whatever her husband is passionate about. So you say, well, okay, the pastor's wife doesn't hold a position, but she's not just a regular person, you know, I understand the place, but what about the purpose? Well, here's the purpose. She's the pastor's wife. She's the pastor's help me. She was the one that God gave that pastor to be uh, suited to help him with the purpose of his life. And if he's in ministry, if he has call, uh, answered the call, if he has chosen to be ordained and go in ministry, then obviously the pastor's wife, as the pastor's help me, is going to be heavily involved in ministry. Go, go to Titus chapter number 2. If you kept your place in 1 Timothy... I'm not sure if you kept your place in 1 Timothy. Uh, I should have told you to do that. But from 1 Timothy, you got 2 Timothy. Then you have the book of Titus. Titus chapter number 2. 
Because the pastor's wife is the pastor's help me, she is obviously going to be heavily involved in the ministry. And, and here's what you need to understand. The Bible teaches that it is appropriate for ladies to take roles of leadership among other ladies. Now, obviously, we're not, you know, we're not Joel Osteen with Victoria Osteen. We're not Joyce Myers. We're not going to have a lady come up behind the pulpit and preach and teach uh, to, uh, in a mixed group with male and females. The Bible teaches against that. Amen. The Bible calls it usurping the authority of, of the man who's supposed to be the one, the pastor, who's supposed to be the one teaching and preaching. But the Bible does teach that it is appropriate for ladies to be able to minister to other ladies. Titus chapter 2, notice verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. The aged women... The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. Notice verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Notice the Bible says here that it is appropriate for the aged women to be able to minister unto the young women. Usually when we look at this passage, we, we look at it and, and the primary application is that we're talking about older women being able to minister to younger women. But let me just say this, this could, uh, you know, you can also apply this to the fact that it could just be talking about someone who's more spiritual or further along. Uh, because obviously, you know, just because you're old doesn't mean you're godly. The, the bio, you know, there's many older people that have ruined their lives. So in the same way that the Bible says that the pastor is the elder, these, these three terms are used interchangeably in the Bible. Bishop, pastor, elder. The pastor is called an elder. In 1 Timothy, the pastor is called the elder. But yet in 1 Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. Paul says to Timothy, hey Timothy, you're a young man. People might despise you because you're a young man. So obviously, being an elder does not necessarily mean you have to be old. You say, well, why do you call a pastor an elder? Because they're supposed to be spiritually mature. They're supposed to have been not a novice. They're supposed to have been someone who knows the Bible, reads the Bible, has some experience. Well, in the same way, you, you know, you could look at your pastor's wife and say, well, she doesn't look very aged, praise God, but, you know, she's got some experience. You know, she's been doing this for a while, and you can say, well, what about this? You know, we've got an old lady, an older lady here. Yeah, but, you know, if she just got saved last week. So you could also apply this to spiritual maturity. The aged women could be talking about spiritually mature, spiritually has raised children, has served the Lord, has uh, 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 been serving in ministry, and they can teach the young women, yes, physically young, but you know what? They can also spiritually young. They can come alongside some younger women and be able to help them in ministry. You know, I have found uh, uh, in ministry that... Uh, I, I, God has allowed me to be able to have a, a ministry that helps other pastors, and oftentimes I get phone calls from other pastors. I'm always happy to help in any way that I can. You know, what's interesting is that oftentimes I have pastors calling me that are physically older than I am. I'm 35 years old. I'll be 35 years old here in, in a couple of weeks. You know, I'm not an old man, but I've been in the ministry for 10 years. And because of that, I've, I've, I have some experience that they just have not. They might physically be older than I am, but they've been in the ministry for one year, two years, five years. And because of that, you know, even though I'm younger than they are, they call for advice. They say, what do you think about this? Have you dealt with something like this? So realize that in the Bible, it's, it's not necessarily always just about age. It's about how mature you are. It's about how much experience you have. It's about how long you've been serving the Lord and doing these things. And look, in the Bible, the Bible teaches that some of these ladies that have some experience, that have done some things, that have raised some kids, that have homeschooled some kids, they are able to come alongside some that are younger, maybe physically or younger in the faith, and, and help them. And here's the point that I'm trying to make. Obviously, the pastor's wife is going to be best suited to play a role in leading the ladies' ministries in the church. I mean, I don't know of any church I've ever been to, except, you know, 
if the pastor's wife is just completely backslidden, usually it's the pastor's wife who's kind of heading all of the ladies' ministries, the ladies' event. I've never seen this where a pastor is just the one that's, you know, putting on the baby showers, right? Putting on the ladies' tea, putting on, you know, the ladies' Christmas party. Obviously, the pastor's wife, you know, does not hold a position, Make sure you understand her place. She does not hold a position. She does not hold an office. She should not be on staff. There are some churches where the pastor's wife on staff. She's getting paid, a, you know, gets a paycheck. That is not biblical. But she's not a regular church member either. Just, ah, oh, she's like anybody else. No, she's the pastor's wife, which means she's the pastor's helpmeet, which means that as a good helpmeet, she's going to uh, be very involved heavily involved in the ministry and then obviously as being a spiritual lady she's going to be involved in being able to minister to those that are younger either physically or just younger in the faith newer in the faith babes in Christ and you know let me just say this you ought to respect and I'm thankful for the spirituality of the ladies that we have at Verity Baptist Church I'm glad. Go to Philippians if you would. Philippians chapter 4. If you're there in 1 Timothy, keep your place there in 1 Timothy. But if you go backwards, you have Titus, 2 and 1 Timothy, 2 and 1 Thessalonians, Colossians, Philippians, Philippians chapter number 4. You know, let, let me just say this, ladies. You ought to be spiritual. You, you should be a soul winner. You should be involved in ministry. I'm not just talking to the pastor's wife now. I'm, I'm just saying all ladies should be spiritual. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible says this, Paul said this, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Notice what Paul said. Paul said, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Notice the apostle Paul here says, hey, let me tell you something about my ministry. Because we talk a lot about Paul. Paul the church planner. Paul the evangelist. Paul the apostle. Paul the great man of God that took the gospel to the Gentiles and, and, and really, you know, uh, uh, got the, the local New Testament uh, uh, church movement off the ground. Paul, but you know what Paul said? Paul said, I got a lot of help from the women. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. And let me just say this again. I've always been thankful that at Verity Baptist Church, our pastor's wife and the pastor's wives that we've trained and the staff wives that we have at our church and the deacon's wife, you know, they have all been faithful, weekly soul winners. They've all been involved in the service and, and, and in serving in the church. They've all been faithful. Hey, I'm thankful for that because believe it or not, there's a lot of pastor's wives who don't go soul winning. There's a lot of deacon's wives and evangelist wives who don't go soul winning, who don't serve in the church. And you know what? Ladies ought to serve. They ought to be spiritual. And that's why I believe at Verity Baptist Church, there's lots of churches where the women don't go soul winning. I mean, I've been to so many churches where it's just, you know, soul winning is like a guy thing. And the ladies are not involved. I'm thankful that at our church, we've always had men and women and families out soul winning. But I believe that part of that is because we've had a pastor's wife. We've had uh, satellite leader's wives. We've had uh, staff wives. We've had uh, uh, evangelist wives who are involved who are spiritual, who are, you know, uh, involved in the things of the Lord. So look, realize that your pastor's wife is suited to play a role in leading, not in a position, not uh, uh, holding an office, but to be able to minister to other ladies. And, you know, you ought to respect her knowledge and her experience. Every once in a while... I'll have a lady, and, you know, some lady will come to one of our services and they'll, they'll want to talk. They'll want to counsel or they need some advice. And, you know, I, I tell ladies, you know, I, I don't meet with ladies alone. And, you know, I'll meet with you and your husband. Um, or if that can't happen, then I'll meet with you and my wife. Uh, but I'm not just going to meet in an office with some other lady. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I, generally, if a lady wants to talk to, talk to somebody, I'll just kind of... You know, say, hey, you know, my wife, you know, she can talk to you. We'll set up a time for you to be able to talk to her. And, and this doesn't happen a lot, but every once in a while, you'll get someone, they kind of roll their eyes like, I don't want to talk to the pastor's wife. I want to talk to the pastor. 
And you know, and I don't ever say this, but you know what I, I want to say? I want to say, my wife has read the Bible cover to cover more times than the average pastor I know. Amen. You know, she's, she's, been, she's been, you know, you say, oh, well, you've been in ministry for 10 years. Well, you know who's been in ministry for 10 years with me? My wife. Amen. You fought all these battles. Well, you know who's fought those battles with me? My wife. You know, you, you've dealt with a lot of issues and you've dealt with a lot of people, but you know who's helped me with that? My wife. So don't, you know, discount the pastor's wife and say, oh, well, she's just like anybody else. No, it's, it's not, you know, if you quit, we keep going. If she quits, we got to find a new pastor. And she's been there and she's been spiritual and she's been a soul winner and she's gained the experience and she's raised some children and she's done something. So don't disc discount that. Don't discount her knowledge and her experience. Realize, yes, recognize the pastor's wife's place. She doesn't hold an office. She's not on staff. She doesn't get a salary. She, but she's not like just any regular church member either. And realize the pastor's wife's purpose. Her purpose as in help meet, her purpose as in help meet means that she's obviously going to be heavily involved in the ministry and means that she's going to be able because of her experience, because she's met some qualifications that have allowed her husband to be in ministry, because they've worked together, she's going to be able to serve and help, and especially with the ladies, to help with the ladies and to minister to the ladies. So don't discount that as well. Go to 1 Thessalonians if you would. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you're there in, in uh, Philippians, you're going to go Colossians into the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'd like to read a few quotes to you if, if, you, if you would not mind. And uh, my, my wife, my wife actually has a class that she does from time to time at our church in Sacramento. It's called the Ministry Wives Class. And this is a class that she teaches to some, to ladies, not there's no men there. She teaches to ladies, and these are ladies that are either on staff at our church or ladies whose husbands are going to go into the ministry. Miss Heidi was in her ministry's wife's class uh, for a year or two before Brother Jared came out here to start uh, this church. And this is something that my wife has done to kind of help prepare some of those ladies. And I, in preparation for this sermon, I, I wrote the outline, but then I, 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 I pulled out her, her uh, folder on our computer of, of all her outlines and lessons she's written, and I, I just started kind of going through them and looking at them and, and seeing some of those things. And I pulled some, of the, some quotes from her classes that I just wanted to read to you. This is a quote from uh, my wife, Miss Joanne Jimenez's Ministry's Wife's class. Uh, here's, here's what she said in one of her classes to, to the ladies. She said, you should never be too busy to be a soul winner. Remember, people will look up to you. And look, as a, as a pastor's wife, and you have a satellite leader here's wife, who's one, is going to very soon be a pastor's wife, you got to be thankful for a ministry wife that goes soul winning, that's faithful. Because look, I'm telling you, there are some, it's funny, they have time to do everything else. They've got time to be on everything else, but they just can't find the time to go soul winning. But well, you know what, as a pastor's wife, you need to make the time to go soul winning. Amen. And you ought to be thankful you have a pastor's wife and you have a satellite leader's wife. And, we, and we're thankful we have staff wives and ministry wives that are, are consistent uh, soul winners. So I said, number one, recognize the pastor's wife's place. Number two, realize the pastor's wife's purpose. Number three, Respect the pastor's wife as a person. You know that you ought to respect the pastor's wife as a person? You say, as, a, as the pastor's wife? No, just as a person. You ought to have respect for the person that plays that role. The role of the pastor's wife is probably the most unappreciated role in ministry. You, you deal with all the same negative things that the pastor does. You deal with all the same harsh criticisms, all the uh, attacks on your family, all those things, but yet you never go and be the you know, keynote speaker at a conference. Everything you do is in the background. Everything do, you do is, is, is you know, not in the spotlight. Everything they do has uh, oftentimes much to do with the things that nobody else wants to do. So you say, well, how as a church family, how as a church family should we treat our pastor's wife? Well, recognize her place. Well, recognize her purpose. But you know what? Respect her as a person. You say, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Appreciate what she does. 
realize that everything that the pastor's wife does, and I realize that here it's all different because it's a satellite, but you know, eventually uh, you'll have a pastor. You eventually, Lord willing, your pastor will be a full-time employee, which he should be. The Bible teaches that. He'll get paid for the work. The Bible says that the labor is worthy of his reward. The Bible says that you got to pay your pastor. But you know what? You're never going to pay your pastor's wife. So all those ladies' tea and all those ladies' Christmas party and all those baby showers and all those homeschool activities and all those uh, field trips and all the, uh, all the events and all the things that, that she does, all of that, all of that is done as a volunteer. Period. Because she wants to. Say, well, how should we treat our pastor's wife? You've got to appreciate what she does. First Thessalonians 5, look at verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. You say, oh, this, isn't about, this is about the pastor. Well, we're in 1 Thessalonians. This is not a pastoral epistle. This is not 1 2 Timothy or Titus. This is written to the church at large. Just in general, know them which labor among you and are over you. And you say, oh, well, that's referring to the pastor. And I would definitely agree that that uh, 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 can be applied to the pastor. But you know what? In ministry, even, even just volunteers, we have leaders. We have team leaders. We have uh, people that lead certain ministries. And the pastor's wife is definitely leading a lot of ministries that involve the ladies. So you can apply this to her. Know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And esteem them, notice verse 13, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. And look, I'm not trying to beat up on, on, on this congregation or our congregation. I, I realize we're in ministry and everything we do, we do for the Lord. But do you realize something? You know, you show up to an event, you show up to a conference, you show up to a party, you show up to this and you show up to that. And it's like people, pe people get this idea that they show up, they enjoy themselves, they leave, and it never even crosses their mind. Somebody set this up. Somebody organized this thing. Somebody paid the bill. Somebody cleaned the building. Somebody put up the decoration. Somebody cooked the food. Somebody put the tables up. Somebody got all this ready. And look, I'm just telling church family, appreciate what your pastor does. Appreciate what your pastor's wife does. Appreciate what your staff does. Realize that there are people working very hard. They're not doing it for the appreciation, but you ought to appreciate it. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. You ought to respect the pastor's wife as a person. You say, how do I do that? Well, you ought to appreciate what she does. You ought to realize everything she does, everything she does is as a volunteer. And by the way, everything the Pazarnskis do is as a volunteer. <laughs> Here, right now. They don't get paid. We don't pay them. The Lord will pay them. The Lord will bless them. Say, why do they do what they do? Because they love the Lord. And because they love you. And you ought to appreciate that. You ought to think about that from time to time. You have some big party. You have some big event. You have some great conference. You have some great thing. Realize planning and energy and effort and work went into that. And realize somebody did that. And, you, and everything that you enjoyed that you did not see get done, it was probably your pastor's wife who did it. Appreciate what she does. Let me say this, go to Matthew 23, if you would. First book in the New Testament, Matthew 23. You ought to respect the pastor's wife as a person. How do you do that? Appreciate what she does. How do you do that? Listen to me very carefully. Go to Matthew 23. Don't put impossible expectations upon her. You know what I've noticed in ministry? What I've noticed in ministry is that people expect more from the pastor's wife than they do from themselves. It's a very pharisaical, hypocritical expectation. Matthew 23, we have Jesus speaking about the Pharisees. I want you to notice what he said to the Pharisees. He says this, For they, for they, the hypocritical Pharisees, bind heavy burden and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders. Notice, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. You know, people will often expect more from the pastor's wife. Ladies will expect more from the pastor's wife and from the pastor. Men will expect more from the pastor than they do themselves. They got no problem just laying 
heavy burdens, grievous to be borne on someone else, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. You know, don't be that church member who puts these impossible expectations on your pastor or your pastor's wife. I've had people over the years, I've had people walk up to me and they're offended, you know, because I don't know their kid's birthday. You know, at Verity Baptist Church, we have a homeschool group that my wife runs. <laughs> we've got, uh, on our homeschool group roster, we've got 80 kids, over 80 kids. I mean, there's, there's 80, 80 some odd kids in our church, and I'm, I'm, you know, we're supposed to remember everybody's birthday? I can barely keep track of my own kids' birthdays. I got six kids, I can barely remember their birthdays. I'm supposed to remember everybody else's birthday? And it's like, well, you're the pastor, or you're the pastor's wife. Well, you don't remember my kid's birthday? He's like, do you remember my kid's birthday? <laughs> do you remember the 80 kid's birthday in this church? But you know, here's what people do with pastors and pastor's wife, is they have this expectation. They're supposed to be superman and superwoman. They're supposed to get it all done, remember everything, never mess up. You know, they, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born but they themselves will not move them. You know, don't put these impossible expectations on the pastor's wife. People expect more from her than they do from themselves. Here's what I've noticed. People expect more from her than they do from themselves and then resent her when she meets and exceeds those expectations. When she actually gets done everything they expect from her, so it's like you can't win. Because they, they put these heavy burdens. Well, you're the pastor's wife, which means that your kids are never supposed to, you know, do anything bad. Your kids better always look good. You better be always, you better always be early. You better always be like, you better always be willing to talk to me no matter how many times I've brought up the same thing to you. And no matter how tired you might look, you know, uh, you're supposed to do this. They have all these heavy expectations. Then she actually meets those expectations and they, they don't, no, they resent her for it. Well, who does she think she is? Look, don't put impossible expectations. You realize people in ministry are people just like you and I. We're all people. We all get tired. We all uh, uh, mess up. We all uh, make mistakes. You know, over the years, my wife and I, we've had, I, I've had so many situations like this. I, I don't know, you know, so many examples. Over the years, we, we've had several situations. We've had several situations over the years where, where, where my kids, you know, were doing something that they should not have been doing. And, you know, and, and I'm not excusing them. You know, I'm talking about our kids are young, obviously. I'm, I'm talking about they're running around. Or they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. Alongside with, like, all these other church kids. And I'm not excusing them, either, any of them. But you know what's funny? You know what we've learned in our ministry? Is that it's like you can have all these kids, you know, all, you know, doing something, you know, getting into the cups or pouring, you know, the, we're talking about toddlers and babies, you know, getting the sugar out, whatever. And then the only ones that get called out for it are our kids. Or, you know, when the story is told, it's like, oh, well, the pastor's kids. And it's like, your kids were there too. <laughs> you left that part out of the story. You know, and it's like, or somebody will come talk to me and my wife. We're like, oh, okay, have you told? No, we're only just telling you. Well, why? Well, because you're the pastor. What, what does that mean? That we're just supposed to, you know, our kids are just supposed to never do anything wrong. Look, be, be careful about just subconsciously having this idea that the pastor's wife is just supposed to be, you know, and the pastor, they're just supposed to be without fault, always just perfect. And don't put impossible expectations on her. So how do I respect her? Just treat, you know, realize that she's a woman, that your pastor is going to be a man just like you are. So appreciate what she does. Don't put impossible expectations on her. You know, understand the load she carries. I try to bring this up, you know, a lot. Whenever I preach on this subject, I, I try to bring it up because I, I think it's an interesting thing. You know, I try to tell our church people like, hey, realize that my wife at church, she's like a single mom. And you say, what do you mean by that? It means that she's doesn't have her husband sitting next to her to help her because I'm up here preaching all the time. That's one of the reasons why whenever we do have a guest speaker, um, you know, not to offend the guest speakers, but whenever we do have a guest speaker, I usually try to take the baby 
from her and, you know, go sit with the baby in the daddy baby room or whatever so she can actually sit through a service. Because 99% of the time at church, she's a single mom. You know, here's my wife with six kids in a row trying to keep them quiet with a little baby. Then you got all these church people. The toilet paper ran out in the, ba in the bathroom. Can you change it? It's like some single guy. And it's like, hello, I got a baby and six kids here. My husband's preaching. Like, can you ask an usher? You know, can you find, can you, can you do it? <laughs> Look, realize, realize that they have boundaries. They're people like everyone else. And especially during church time, a lot of times they don't have any help. So set, you know, realize that there are boundaries. You ought to try to uh, protect her. You ought to try to protect the pastor's wife from attacks on her and her family. There are subtle, subtle ways that people try to attack the pastor. Something I've noticed over the years is this. People will do this. They'll, they'll play this game, you know, divide and conquer. Well, they'll act like they love me. We just love the pastor. The pastor is so amazing. His preaching is so great. You know, but then the pastor's wife, they're like rolling their eyes. You know that an attack on the pastor's wife is an attack on the pastor? Or, or vice versa. The pastor's wife is great, and, you know, but we don't like the pastor. Now, when that happens, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> as long as you like my wife, I'm fine. That's all I need. You know, I, don't, I got enough friends. But, you know, people will try this divide and conquer thing. And, uh, and oftentimes, you know, they, tr they try to pin the pastor and the pastor's wife. Look, just realize, just, just please understand this. When somebody, as a church, I'm trying to, I'm saying this to the church family. When somebody, usually it's a lady, starts just, you know, criticizing the pastor's wife, attacking the pastor, acting like, oh, we love the church. We love the pastor, but the pastor's wife, the pastor's wife. No, you know what? They hate the church and they hate the pastor. And they're attacking the pastor's wife because that's an attack on the pastor. That's an attack on the church. Look, you know that if you can get a pastor's wife to get discouraged, and, and the ladies we have here, they're strong in the Lord. They've got thick skin. Nothing's going to stop them, you know, in the Lord. But you know that if you can get the pastor's wife discouraged, and get her to not want to be part of church, and get her to, uh, you know, quit church, you can destroy church. So when you attack the pastor's wife, you attack the pastor. Let me say this. When you attack the pastor's kids, you're attacking the pastor. You're attacking the pastor's wife, especially a pastor's wife. You know, moms are like that mama bear. They can take a lot, but you start messing with their kids, you start trying to, you know, do things to their kids, and they could really uh, uh, hurt the ministry. So look, as a church, just realize, realize, if you've got some, you know, grumpy, unhappy lady or guy, and it seems like they love the church, but they're just always just taking jabs at the pastor's kids, those people hate the church, hate the pastor, and are trying to discourage the pastor. They're taking jabs at the pastor's wife. Oh, the church is great, but the pastor's wife, you know. She doesn't, she, she should do a better job. They hate the church, they hate the pastor, they're trying to destroy the church. An attack on the pastor's family is an attack on the church. And you know, let me just say this, you know, in regards to how to treat the kids, the pastor's kids, you know, really two thoughts. Don't burden them with ministry expectations. I've had people do this at our, at our church, and you know, I, I've tried to teach and preach and correct it, well, people, people, you know, they walk up to your kids. They're, they're talking to an eight-year-old. Well, you're going to be the future pastor of Verity Baptist Church, aren't you? You're going to go into the ministry and be a pastor. Why are you going to start a church someday? And they're talking like a nine-year-old. It's like, don't put, that, don't put that on my kids. They don't need that pressure. And by, by the way, our goal with our kids ought to be that they love the Lord and they serve the Lord, and, and, and that's all we care about. And I can tell you this for my wife and I. You know, you say, what do you care about your kids? I couldn't care less if my children never go into ministry as long as they love the Lord and as long as they walk with God. If they, if they decide to go into ministry one day and be a pastor or missionary or something like that, that'll make me proud. If they decide to go start some business and work in the secular world and as long as they're faithful to church and they're soul winners and they, and they uh, decide to come alongside and help a pastor in the ministry, you know what, I'd be just as proud. It's not like I'd be like, oh, well, you know, my, my, my kids are, you know, they're soul winners and they're, faith, they're three to thrive, but, you know, they never went into ministry, so they disappoint. That, that thought would never cross my mind. 
You know, the Christian life, let me just say this. In the Christian life, you're either a pastor or you're helping a pastor. That's it. You know, you're either starting a church or you're involved in a church. But look, we should all be in the work of the ministry. We should all be involved. So don't put these expectations on these kids. We want them to serve the Lord. We want them to walk with God. We want them to be soul winners. We, but whatever they do for a job, who, who cares? As long as they're walking with God. And then you know what? With the pastor's kids, let me just say this. Realize that they're going to mess up. Like everyone else's kids. They're going to do stupid things, say stupid things, do things that they shouldn't do. They're, they're going to do things. And look, you should never, you need to correct yourself. If, you're, if, if, if there's a situation and you're just like freaking out, but the only reason you're freaking out is because they're the pastor's kids. And if it was anybody else's kids, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. If it was your kids, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. That is the wrong mentality. Now, obviously, the pastor's kids especially as they grow up, they can't be riotous. They can't just be drunkards. We understand that. But we're talking about just normal things that all the kids do, all the teenagers do. Look, you ought not put this heavy load and this expectations on them. You ought to realize they're kids like everybody else. They're a family like everybody else. So protect against that. Let me say this. Have boundaries. You say, how, do, how, how can I be a blessing to my pastor's wife. Have boundaries. You know she does not have to be available for you 24 hours a day? I mean, have some boundaries. Here, here's a quote from one of the classes that my wife taught. It says this, just because you're home, this is what she taught the ladies, just because you're home doesn't mean you're available. Learn to say no to church members during the school days. And this was specifically about homeschooling. Don't overcommit. There is no such thing as a woman who can do it all. If you attempt to, you will burn out. She wrote this, just because you're the pastor's wife doesn't mean you have to do everything. Learn to delegate. You know, have boundaries in regards to the pastor's family. And this is for the pastor's wife and the pastor. Have some boundaries and realize that they, they've got a family. Look, they've got a marriage. And they need time for their family, for their kids, to raise their kids. You know? And look, I'm not... You, sometimes you got to be careful because you say things and then people get offended, you know, because they, maybe they've done these things. And I don't know anybody here that's done this, and I can't even really think of anybody that's done this in a long time in our church. But look, we've had situations in the past where people just randomly show up to our house, just unannounced, you know, just show up and just, you know, want to, like, hang out for, like, two hours. And it's like, we're busy. And look, no, no offense, we love you, but we got six kids. Like, when you got six kids... My wife, you know, keeps the house pretty tidy or whatever, but when you got six kids, you're not just guest ready 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and she shouldn't have that expectation either. You know, so just realize there are some boundaries. You know, fellowship with your pastor and your pastor's wife, but realize, you know, at three in the morning, they've got to go home <laughs> on a Sunday night. You know, you've been counseling and, and asking them all these questions. You'll know, realize that they need time. You know, they need to rest. They need time with their family. So respect their boundaries. Protect them. Help them. Go to 1 uh, Timothy chapter 5 if you would. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And again, I just want to give you some kind of, just some, some, some ideas, a little bit of insight. One day I'm going to preach a series called Types of Church Members. There's all sorts of different types of church members that we've kind of noticed and learned about over the last decade of ministry. But I want to talk to you about two types of church members that can really hurt the pastor and the pastor's wife. There are two different types of church members that will try to hurt the pastor's family. The first type is the person who's just against all leadership. You know, the pastor and the pastor's wife, they can't do anything right. Everything they do is wrong. Every, you know, every decision they make is a wrong decision. This is not personal against the pastor or the pastor's wife, though. These people are just against leadership in general. Like, once you hire staff, you know, the, everything the staff does is wrong. The staff is lazy. The staff wives can't do anything right. You know, it doesn't matter who. You, you put somebody in some position, they don't know what they're doing. They're not right. So there's these certain people who are just against all leadership. Anyone in leader, and a lot of this is motivated by envy. So look, don't be that person. 
who's just, you know, as soon as, as soon as somebody gets hired, as soon as somebody becomes a soul winning captain, as soon as somebody becomes a song leader, you know, you just start criticizing them. And look, just realize you're, you're an envious person. And, you know, you need to fix that in your heart. But don't be that person. And those of you around that person realize, okay, this person just has a problem with leadership in general. Anybody who gets promoted into leadership, anybody who gets hired, they, they can't do it right. They're all doing it wrong. But then there's a different type of person that will attack the pastor's wife and attack the pastor's family. This is the person who just believes that the pastor and the pastor's wife need to be brought down a notch. You know, and this person, they're not necessarily against leadership. They just, and what we've learned is that the, these people are generally, maybe they've been hurt in the past by a pastor and a pastor's wife or a pastor's wife. Or, you know, they just feel like the pastor and the pastor, they just get too many compliments. They, they get too many nice things done for them. And they just think it's their job to just kind of bring them down a notch. And what we've learned with these people, it's really interesting. Because when you hire staff, they'll love the staff. I mean, they'll just lavish gifts upon the staff. If it's the staff's, you know, birthday or anniversary, they're just going all out, all these great gifts, all these things, you know. But, they, but you have a pastor appreciation day, and they'll just not come to that service. Or, you know, so they're doing something special with the pastor's wife, and they just won't get involved in that. And it's just these people who just want to bring the pastor and bring the pastor's wife down or not. You know, here's the thing. Don't be that person. And, and just... You know, for those of you in ministry and if you're listening online, just realize, you know, it's a normal thing. I've talked to pastors and they all, they're like, yeah, I got that too. I got, the, I got one like that. You know, it's funny. Years ago, my wife and I had just celebrated an anniversary. And we just had a wedding anniversary. Literally, like, like two days had passed. And we had this individual walk up to us. And this person had not you know, said anything about our anniversary and not mentioned it, didn't say happy anniversary, didn't write a card, which is fine. They don't need to. We don't expect that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just interesting, though, because we just had an anniversary and this person just completely ignored it. But they walked up to me and my wife and they were like, hey, you know, um, brother so-and-so and his wife, and they just talked about this random couple in the church, not even on staff or anything. Like, they're having an anniversary in a few weeks. I was thinking that the church should just raise up money to send them to Hawaii. And this is like my wife and I had never been to Hawaii at this point. And it's just kind of like, okay, so we just had an anniversary and you didn't mention it at all, which is fine. You don't have to. But now you're wanting me to like raise up this money to send this random family to Hawaii. And, you know, you just kind of walk away from that thinking like, are you trying to hurt my feelings? <laughs> like, are you trying to offend us? Like, are you trying to just like make a point? Like this random family that's just a regular couple you know, let's do this, you know, but you, let's not. Don't be that person. Those are the type of people you deal with in ministry, and sometimes you're just like, are you, tr what, what is the point of this? What, what is the point of, of, of bringing that up or trying uh, uh, to do that, you know? What is the point of these things? Let me read to you another quote here from um, the class. As, this is something that we've taught the, the ladies in ministry. As a pastor's wife, you will encounter many situations with people being critical towards you, your husband, the church, or your children. Women tend to be more verbal than men with complaints, so unfortunately this oftentimes will fall on the pastor's wife. So look, realize that there are people who are like this. There are people who do this. There are people who feel this way. And don't be that person and be careful to protect your pastor's family um, from these types of people. First uh, Timothy chapter 5, if you would. Look at verse 14. Let me give you point number four. Point number one was recognize the pastor's wife's place. Point number two was realize the pastor's wife's purpose. Point number three was respect the, pastor wife, the pastor's wife as a person. Point number four, remember the pastor's wife's priorities. And by the way, let me just say this. Her priorities are the same as any other lady's priorities. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says this, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. If you're married, this is God's will for your life. In fact, here Timothy says, I will. He says, this is God's will that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, if you would, you're there in 1 Timothy, just flip over to 2 Timothy and Titus. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, 
It says this, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Hey, remember the pastor's wife's priorities. Say, well, what are her priorities? Her priorities are the same as any other lady's priorities. You say, what are they? Number one, first God. And look, by the way, those are everybody's priorities. It should be everybody's priorities, right? God. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hey, her first priority is her walk with God. And by the way, ladies and men, that ought to be everybody's first priority. Say, so what about the pastor's wife? What's her second priority? Her husband. In fact, what makes her special in this church is that she is her husband's wife. She is the pastor's wife, which means she's the pastor's help me. So you know what her priority is? Her husband, her marriage, and her being an help me for her husband. What's her third priority? Her children. God has given her a grave responsibility, just like he's given every mother a responsibility to raise children for the Lord. And her priority are her children, the children that God has given her and her husband to raise. What's her fourth priority? Here's her fourth priority, the church. You say, well, aren't the church and God the same thing? No. Now look, church is a priority. Church is a priority. But church and serving in church is different than having a walk with God. You know that you can serve in a church and be completely backslidden and not right with God? So you say, well, what, what are the priorities? God, her husband, her children, then serving in the church. The ladies' tea, the ladies' Christmas party, the baby showers, the cleaning ministry, the bringing food to moms that just had a baby and bringing food to ladies that just had a, a surgery, you know, and all the millions of other things that our pa pastor's wife does, all of those things are not even the first, second, or third priority in her life. Now, we're thankful. We're thankful that we have a pastor's wife, you have a satellite leader's wife that's not lazy, that they get up early, they stay up late, they love the Lord, they work hard, but realize everything they do is because they want to, because they love the Lord, and it's, and it's their fourth priority. So realize they've got a priority to be keepers at home. They've got a priority to marry, bear children, and guide the house. Her, their first priority is to God. Their second priority is to their marriage. Their third priority is to their children. Their fourth priority is to the church. So, here, so here's the point. Don't put these expectations on them to try to get those mixed up. Well, you have to help me because I'm in the church. Well, okay, not at the expense of her children. I mean, when we started in ministry, this was years ago, we started in ministry, we literally would have, and of course we started the church, you know, different than how, you know, when this church gets started, you, you started with a, a, a nice building and with a group of mature Christians. When we started, we started in our living room and we had, you know, uh, a few people that were mature, but uh, for the most part, it was all brand new Christians. I mean, we would have this thing where they, we, we'd have these ladies who would go to the store, buy groceries, get, have like three carts full of groceries, then call Miss Joanne can you come give us a ride? We're at the grocery store, you know, we're in the parking lot, we got five, you know, just in the middle of the day. And of course, you know, when we were young in ministry, it was like, yeah, of course, you know. But after a while, it's like, no, sorry, figure it out. You say, oh, that's me. No, you know what? She needs to raise her kids. She needs to homeschool her children. You should have planned it out better. Your plan shouldn't be, oh, just call the pastor's wife, she'll bail us out. At that point, you're putting yourself above her children. You're putting yourself above her marriage. You know, realize that she has priorities, she has a purpose, respect those. And everything she, she does, appreciate it. And defend her when people try to criticize her and they try to, you know, uh, uh, bring her down because that's really an attack on the church. Just by, by, by way of conclusion, go, go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 if you would. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. While you turn there, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase some of these things that my wife wrote in her class. This is, these are not direct quotes. These are just paraphrases. But often there are troublemaking ladies that put themselves in competition with the pastor's wife. Be careful. Be careful with those. 
these women that put themselves in competition with the pastor's wife, men will do this too. I call it the Absalom effect, where they try to like outdo the pastor or the pastor's wife. You know, they'll sit there at the gate and, and spend all this time and energy with people. And then it's like this subtle criticism like, oh, the king doesn't have time for you, just like Absalom did. But here's what's always funny to me about that is that, you know what, Absalom, yeah, it's easy for you to sit at the gate for 40 years, eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, when you're not actually running a kingdom. Amen. David's actually running a kingdom. Oh, well, you know, the, the pastor's wife, you know, she doesn't have time to spend time with you like I do. Yeah, because she's throwing all, up, putting together all these events that you're criticizing her at. Well, the pastor doesn't, yeah, because he's preaching three times a week. Because he's studying and, and, and meeting with people and helping people, you know, just keep your eyes open for that. And realize that when people are criticizing the leadership, there is an agenda behind that. But, uh, the, oh, here's another quote I wanted to read. Um, no, this isn't a quote, it's a paraphrase. Uh, but it's, uh, here's what I took away from some of the points that I saw there. Many pastors' wives detach from the church and the ministry. And I, look, I, I will say this. I wish I could say I've only seen this once or twice. I've seen this so many times in my life. I, it's crazy. I mean, I've, I've been to churches where the pastor's wife just did not come to church for like six months. And it was because people were attacking her. And people were just criticizing her, criticizing her kids, and just finding every excuse to just be mean to her. And, and, and you know, and obviously it wasn't right. And it wasn't right for her to not come to church. I mean, I've, I've known of churches where the pastor's wife took her own life. Commit, literally committed suicide. And look, I'm just telling you, you, you may think like, I don't know, you, you really need a whole sermon on this? Look, the attack is real. The devil will try to attack a church, and oftentimes it's done through the pastor's family. So you got to protect her. You got to encourage her. Yeah, you ought to preach, you know, when it comes to your pastor and your pastor's wife, and I'm thankful at Verity Baptist Church Sacramento, we have a church family that loves us and they take care of us and all that. But, you know, I'm telling you, remember their, remember their special days, remember their birthdays, remember their anniversaries. You know, be thankful for everything they do. Honor them in God for, 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 for the work's sake. You know, love them for the work they're doing. So just by way of conclusion, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 if you would. And let me just end by saying this. To any future pastor's wife or future deacon's wife or future staff wife that's listening right now, maybe in the room there's a, a young lady that will one day be a pastor's wife, or maybe online we've got some pastor's wives or future pastor's wife that may be listening to the sermon. Let me just end by giving you some characteristics of a great pastor's wife. And um, obviously this is aside from the, what the Bible specifically says in uh, 1 Timothy 3, but just some things that I found that are some great characteristics for a, for a pastor's wife. And maybe if you're a future pastor's wife, you know, you can kind of see, do you have these? And if you don't have these, you should work on them. Uh, but here's some characteristics. They ought to be silent. And when I say silent, I mean they should have a meek and quiet spirit. This is what the Bible says. They shouldn't be a loud mouth, just obnoxious person, but they also should not be a gossip. And you know, the pastor's wife often uh, just knows a lot of information and, and has a lot of information about, you know, things she deals with in church and counseling other ladies and, and whatever. And so, you know, a pastor's wife needs to be somebody who needs to just uh, know how to keep her mouth closed. And oftentimes in, in our church, you know, sometimes people will start trying to ask my wife questions and pry information out of her. And she's like, no, I'm just not, I'm not going to talk about that. And that's something that a pastor's wife needs to have. And if you're a gossip, you know, and you're going to go into ministry, your husband wants to go into ministry, uh, you, you need to be careful with that. And obviously, you know, um, all of these things are things we've already seen in Miss Heidi, which is why we've sent, you know, Brother Jared here uh, to start this church. But, you know, have a meek and quiet spirit, not be a gossip, not be this woman that's talking bad about her husband or her kids. Here's another characteristic. Be a hard worker. You can't be lazy. Look, ministry is hard work. The work of the ministry is what the Bible says. So, and the wives work hard. So if you're going to be a pastor's wife, you can't be lazy. Here's one, you need to be independent. Sometimes, I, you know, because we train people for the ministry in our church, sometimes I see these ladies, and I think to myself, like, these people are not going to make it in ministry, and here's why. The wife is just a big baby. Like, she's very needy. 
She needs all, you know, all this attention. That is not going to work in ministry. The wife needs to be independent. I'm not talking about like, a, you know, feminist independent. I'm talking about the fact that she can, she can get things done and doesn't need to be pampered and babied. Because again, in the church, you're running a lot of stuff as the pastor's wife. You're also like a single mom at the church. So the, the pastor's wife needs to be very independent. She can't be babied. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes these, there's wives that are just completely babied by their husbands. And, you know, if that's you, whatever, more power to you, but you can't, probably aren't going to make it in the ministry. Um, here's another one, thick skin. In the ministry, you're going to get hurt. People are going to attack you. They're going to criticize you unjustly. They're going to hold you up to expectations that they themselves won't meet. So you've got to have some thick skin, be able to take some, uh, some of those criticisms. And then you have to have good people skills. Uh, in ministry and as a pastor's wife, you cannot be rude. You cannot be oblivious to people's feelings. You have to be able to have empathy and realize, you know, how to deal with people and love people and be gentle. And just, you know, to end, let me say this. To my wife, to Miss Joanne Jimenez, who serves as a pastor's wife at Verity Baptist Church, to Miss Heidi Pizarski, who will be the, uh, Lord willing, the future pastor's wife here and has been the satellite leader's wife, and, uh, and, and to, you know, the staff wives at Verity Baptist Church, to any pastor's wife who's maybe listening online, you know, let me just say this. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for the work you do. I realize that you're often just not appreciated and often criticized um, unjustly. But again, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So you say, well, how do, how do I deal with my pastor's wife? How do we deal with the pastor's wife? Recognize her place realize her purpose, respect her as a person, remember her priorities, appreciate her. Don't put these impossible expectations on her and protect her, protect her kids, protect her family because there will be people who will try to come in and just criticize and discourage and try to just bring them down and think they're getting you know, too much attention and just protect them against that attitude in general. Let's buy our heads and have a word.